Good morning, Calvary. So I wanted to bring to your attention several important things that are going on in the life of the church. One of them is that on Sunday, February 12th, yes, it is Super Bowl Sunday, but here at Calvary, we are also going to be doing the Super Bowl of caring. And this is where people come to the church, they bring canned food items or non-perishable food items with them, and they vote for their favorite team that is playing in the Super Bowl. And so you can bring your canned food items on the 12th, you can bring them anytime leading up to the 12th, but we are so excited to be able to do this again this year and all of the canned food items that we collect they're going to go to our mini food pantry and the saint james food bank and they're going to feed people who are in desperate need of food so we hope that you'll participate in that the other thing that we want you to know about is that we have a lot of really fun things happening on sunday september 26th one of the things that's going to be happening is we're going to have a committee fair during our coffee hour downstairs in fellowship hall so we're gonna have like more food than we normally do at a regular coffee hour and we're going to be asking people to um, hear about our different committees and figure out ways in which they can become more involved and plugged into those committees and then we are going to be having a really exciting event led by our youth out on the front lawn at one. And if you want more information about that, be sure to contact Katie Rosenson or Megan Cisneros because it is her community project that she's planning. And so all of those things are gonna be taking place on the 26th. And we hope that you're excited and that you're going to participate. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. The Spirit of the Lord is in us, anointing us, sending us to bring good news, to bind up, to proclaim favor, to comfort, to provide, to loosen. The day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord has come. So
join in saying aloud our prayer of illumination. To startle us, O God, with your truth, and open our hearts and our minds to your wondrous love. Speak your word to us, silence in us any voice but your own, and be with us now as we turn our attention, our minds, and our hearts to you. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The scripture lesson is taken from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Children of the Heavenly Father, safely in His bosom gather, nestling bird nor star in heaven, Such a refuge was given. God his own doth tend and nourish, In his holy courts they flourish, From all evil things he spares them, In his mighty arms he bears them. Neither life nor death shall ever From the Lord his children sever. Unto them his grace he showeth, And their sorrow all he knoweth. Praise the Lord in joyful numbers, your protector never slumbers. At the will of your defender, every foeman must surrender. He giveth or he taketh, God his children ne'er forsaketh. Is the loving purpose solely to preserve them pure and holy? More secure is no ones of the Savior, not yon star on high abiding, nor the bird in home nest hiding. 
today we are going to look at a passage of scripture that I think is one that I tend to preach on often and that's because it is such a fascinating and rich scripture passage. There's a lot that can be said about it and every time I talk about it in a sermon I always walk away thinking I didn't even begin to scratch the surface of what this passage says and honestly that is one of the things that is the most beautiful about scripture is that you can study it and continue studying it and read the same story again and again and again and every single time you can take something new away from the story this story is so important that we're actually going to do a two-part sermon series on this story so the first part is today and then next sunday we're going to be looking at the second part of the story and i just i want to say that i really hope that you come for both parts of the story because it is a story that starts off well and we're going to look at the good part today and then it takes a horrible horrible turn and that is the part that we're going to be looking at next Sunday. So, this is the story in the Gospel of Luke of Jesus going to the synagogue there in Nazareth and reading a scroll in front of all of the people there. And... Before we actually talk about the text, I think it's important for us to spend time talking about all of the work that the gospel writer Luke puts into setting the stage for this moment. There has been a buildup leading up to this moment since the very beginning of the gospel of Luke. And we might not in hearing the story, realize that Luke has been actively setting the stage, that everything has been leading up to this important moment. So let's take a couple of uh, steps back. One of the first things that Luke does in order to set the stage for this story is he talks about the importance of Nazareth. And Nazareth comes up again and again and again in the first couple of chapters of the Gospel of Luke. Now, for those of us who um, pay a lot of attention during Christmas time, we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea. And that's absolutely right, he was. But he is Nazarene. And his hometown is not the town that he was born in. His hometown is Nazareth. So if we recall, his family has to travel, travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem in order to partake in the census, right? And to be counted. And then once they, you know, presumably go through the census and Jesus is born and people come and pay him homage, they have to escape and then they come from Egypt to Nazareth. And it says in the first part of today's passage that Nazareth is where he was brought up. And that is such a great translation of that Greek word because that Greek word literally means to be fed and nourished. So Nazareth is the place where Jesus was fed, where Jesus became the person that he is. It's in Nazareth that he learned how to be a good and faithful Jewish man. It's in Nazareth that he learned how to be a neighbor. It's in Nazareth that he learned to be a good human. Nazareth is the place that has raised him and nourished him and brought him up. And so that is the first thing that Luke does that sets the stage for this story. And so at this point in the story, Jesus has already entered into his public ministry and he has begun to, you know, make a name for himself. And he is like 
the small town boy that has made it big. And he's kind of outgrown his hometown. But here he is back in Nazareth in the synagogue. And we can learn a lot about Nazareth and what Nazareth was like from the things that Luke says in this passage. Um, one of the things that I find to be true in scripture that you know my former Bible professors and scholars pointed out to me and that I try to point out to you all is oftentimes the things that are strange in a text are the things that are important. Either something you feel like it should be included and it's not there and its absence is what's important and it's trying to communicate something or there are these like strange details that are included and it's those strange details that are important. So that is what is happening in this story. So we can figure out from Luke a lot of the things that are happening in Nazareth. We know outside of Luke that Nazareth was a small town based on records and you know educated speculating. Uh, people have assumed, figured out, calculated that there was probably about 400, 500 people in Nazareth at the time that Jesus lived there. And that's a small town. That's a very small town. And out of those 400, 500 people, everybody would have known Jesus. They would have known who he was. And he's probably actually related to the vast majority of them because that's how it, how it worked back then. And so we can know that Nazareth was a small town, but we can also in this passage see their priorities. It says that they have a synagogue, which is a really big deal for a small town to have a synagogue, to have invested the money in building a synagogue. And a synagogue is, I want to equate it to a fellowship hall in that it is a gathering place, it is a meeting place, it's where people get together and do all sorts of things and spend time with each other, but on the Sabbath, it is a place of worship. And so we know that even though Nazareth was a very small town, they had a synagogue. We also know from this passage that they had scrolls. And we might hear that and not think anything of that because we go to a church where the sanctuary is just peppered with Bibles. But you have to remember that this is well before the printing press. And scrolls were this very, very priceless thing. They were on papyrus, suspended on reeds, and they were extremely fragile and extremely expensive. And so for a small town like Nazareth to have been able to afford scrolls, that says a lot about their sense of priorities, that they would have you know, spent the money and spent the time to have these and it would communicate to us like the integral importance of scripture there in their town. We also know from this text that there was an attendant. Um, Luke uses that word twice in his gospel and it means someone who preserves records. And so we know that there was someone there at the synagogue who their job was to take care of the scrolls and preserve the scrolls. And we're told in the text that this person selected a scroll, not Jesus. Jesus wasn't like handing that one there. Instead, the attendant selected it and handed it to Jesus and Jesus unrolled it and found the part from that book of Isaiah that he wanted to read 
and read it aloud. And then there's this like curious sentence right after that, which is, and then he rolled the scroll back up and handed it to the attendant. And so I think Luke includes that because he wants us to know that Jesus understands what he's dealing with, that he's dealing with this thing that is priceless and that he is taking great care of it and that it means a lot to him. And so all of these context clues then are painting this picture that Nazareth is like a really great place to live and a really great place probably to have grown up because it's so small, everybody knows everybody, they have great priorities, they have all of these resources, people grow up in the faith, and it just seems like a beautiful place. And as somebody who's in-laws, watch a lot of the Hallmark Channel, at this point in the story, it sounds like a Hallmark movie where there's this cute small town and you know everyone loves the small town values and people are going to learn a lesson and then you know it's going to end well it's going to have a happy ending because every single Hallmark movie has a happy ending and like all these things right like this is where the story is headed and because we assume this is where the story is headed then when the story doesn't go that way, when it ends up having this like crazy turn of events and it starts to really go sideways and it moves from a fairy tale with a happy ending to, you know, this like terrifying thing, it, it begs the question then like, what has happened that is so combustible? Like, what is the thing that has occurred that just sends everybody off the edge? Because here are these people who have raised Jesus, who are probably related to Jesus, who deeply love Jesus, who are probably proud of who he has become, and they're gathering in this place that is so important to them. And Jesus is reading from a scroll that is so important to them. And the moment he gets done reading, they become angry. Why? What, what just happened? And what just happened is the final words that Jesus says. Jesus rolls up the scrolls and he gives it back to the attendant and he sits down and then he says to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, <clears throat> there's something else that is significant that Luke has mentioned in this passage and that Luke has spent the entirety of his gospel mentioning and bringing up that plays an important part in why this sentence is so problematic and that is the spirit of the Lord. From the very very beginning of the gospel of Luke the Spirit of the Lord plays a big role. So we know that Mary is told that she is carrying a child and she asks him, how can this be? Because I'm still a virgin, you know, how does this make sense? And she's told by the angel that the Spirit of God is upon her. And in our, you know, church language, we like to then refer to that as being conceived by the Holy Spirit. That's how Jesus was born. That explains how Mary got pregnant. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus goes to the Jordan River 
and he is baptized and we are told that the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. And so here we have this moment of the Spirit being on Jesus again. And then we're told that the Spirit of the Lord is what drives him out into the wilderness where he is there for 40 days and ends up being tempted. And so again and again and again, there is this mention of God's Spirit. And so when Jesus begins to speak then to the people in the temple, he says first that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. And so then when he says that the scripture has been fulfilled in their hearing, this is what sets them over the edge. You see, there is a difference between scripture and the word of God. And that might startle us and surprise us, but I'm gonna say it again. There is a difference between scripture and the word of God. Scripture is the text, is the words. And it is really easy for us to domesticate scripture. It's really easy for us to take scripture and to twist it into whatever we want it to mean or be. And we know this is true because we look at church history, Christian history, and we see this happen time and time again where the scriptures have been used to justify something. So, for example, people would go to church on Sunday, they would hear the scriptures, and then they would go home to their plantations and beat their slaves on Monday. How, how can this be? How is this possible? Or people would go to church and they would hear the scriptures being read and then they wouldn't stand up to the third right. Or people would go to church and then in the name of the church, in the name of God, participate in crusades. Or people would participate in forcible conversions. And even now we we do this we go to scripture we go to church on sunday and we hear the scriptures being read and then we walk out of the church and someone who's sitting on the street corner asks us for a dollar and we pretend we can't hear them and the way all of that makes sense the way any of that can make sense is that we can take the scriptures and we can domesticate them and we can use them to justify whatever it is that we're doing and to validate whatever it is that we think and whatever it is that we believe. And we can uh, imagine that the people in the synagogue, how they would have acted if Jesus had read that passage from Isaiah and then said, and all the people at Nazareth are so great and they just love God with their whole heart and soul and mind and they are God's chosen people and how good the people in Nazareth would have felt and they would have left and been patting themselves on the back. You can imagine when people read a Joel Olstein book 
and then they just feel so good about themselves and how they are doing exactly what God wants them to do. And it's really easy for us to want to hear something, to hear scripture and be told that we're exactly right. Or for us to hear scripture and for it to make us feel good about ourselves um, and affirm what we believe and what we think and what we're doing. <clears throat> and all of that is domesticating scripture. The difference between scripture and the word of God is the spirit of God because then there are these words that we hear and that we read and that we see now, but then the Holy Spirit is at work and the Holy Spirit convicts us and challenges us and illuminates us and encourages us and causes us to grow and stretch and to think differently and to be open-minded and to question ourselves. And the Holy Spirit does all of those things. And that is what happens there in the synagogue. That is the combustible moment because Jesus, yes, he reads the scriptures, but it isn't this rote reading, it isn't by memory, it isn't saying words to just to say words, but Jesus then, because he's filled with the Holy Spirit, says, this has been fulfilled in your hearing, and the people feel the Spirit and feel the conviction, and that is what is so hard. And I think that this is a really important lesson for us to learn. The point of church, yes, I mean, we can go to church and we can experience peace and joy and, uh, you know, sometimes comfort and all of those things, but that isn't the point of church. The point of church is for us to grow. And sometimes that means for us to be uncomfortable. And how we grow is by listening to the Holy Spirit. I think that's what's so interesting about the sentence that Jesus says that the scriptures have been fulfilled in your hearing because it means then that when we engage with the Holy Spirit that it is interactive that it is back and forth that yes we hear scripture yes we read scripture yes to all those things but it's in our hearing of scripture this internalization that the holy spirit is at work and i hope and i pray that the holy spirit is at work in you and that you are open to it in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit Amen. A Thought by John Petty Hearing is an intimate thing. The words literally come all the way inside one's body, where they are then processed and understood through one's neural connections. Hearing Jesus' words, connecting them with the fulfillment of Scripture, seeing Jesus' ministry of release on behalf of the poor. All this is apprehended intimately right now.
today. receive the benediction. May the grace and peace and love of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>